So I think where we're going next is to Lucknow um, and our dear friend, Dr. Urvashi Sani. Um, Urvashi is the uh, founder of uh, and CEO of Study Hall Educational Foundation. Um, she's a social entrepreneur, a women's rights activist, and an educationist who has been a pioneering activist in the field for more than three decades. She's a leading expert in curriculum design and reform, teacher training, education governance, with a special focus on girls' education and gender equality. She is so much more than that, uh, too, because she is uh, an inspiration to many of us who are in the room right now. Uh, with that, I turn it over to Urvashi. Thank you, Reba, and uh, thank you for organizing this. So topical, so relevant, and so important. Uh, you know, uh, many of uh, our teachers and students from Study Hall Education Foundation Lucknow have joined, and I'm sure that they have been, they are delighted by uh, all the presentations that they've been through. So thank you very much, and I've started right away. So uh, Reva, can I share my screen? Yeah, sure. I I to Gary and he said I could. So I'm going to try that. Yeah, sure. I've given you the permission, Urvashi Ji. Okay. When I can do it, Navi. At the center, you see a green button that should... No, but I'm going to just... Ah, there we are. have full presentation, but I'm not to do that. Uh, okay, so uh, I've called my talk uh, uh, Education for Peace. I wanted to start off by uh, talking a little about our vision. Our vision is to educate everyone for gender equality, social justice, personal flourishing, and active democratic citizenship. And we believe that the important aim of education is not just to know, but to learn to live. And this comes from a graduate's Wallace I know peace doesn't figure anywhere in any of these words, but if you think about it, it's not possible to, sorry, it's not really possible to have peace without peaceful gender relations. And that's not possible without gender equality. And secondly, you can't have peace unless you have social justice. And if you want personal flourishing, then you need to have a peaceful environment for people to flourish. And all this is not possible unless you have a vibrant, active democratic situation. So we have, we work at peace. In a, I will be giving examples during my presentation of how we work at peace. We really believe that the goal of all teaching and learning is to help enable students to find answers to the central question, who am I? And what is my relationship with the universe and others? I think this is an important question. And in fact, I was very struck. I had a conversation with some of my students. Many of them are here. And by the way, we have students from class three onwards, if you notice. And it was interesting, we started off with talking about Ukraine and then we went on to different kinds of violence. And finally, the students came up with the fact that it's all about self-awareness, all about our relationship with the universe, with ourselves and with everyone in it. And I'm reminded actually about of a Vedantic uh, aphorism, which is, says, Aham Brahmasmi. And what that says very simply is, that I am everything that exists and everything that exists is in me. And you know, if you can understand that deeply, and I think that's the essence of the Vedanta philosophy, then how can you have anything but a loving relationship with everyone and everything in the universe? Um, we really believe that classrooms are magical and radical spaces of Everyone talks about the lack of education as a result of all the ills in the world. But I ask the question that we have had more education over the decades and the centuries, and have we become more loving? Have we become more peaceful? Have we become more nonviolent, more caring, more just? I think not. And I don't know whether, I'm sure Putin has a string of uh, degrees next to his name. So I think that yes, education 
can be a very powerful individual and social transformative force, but provided it is transformed, provided we use its potential to do more than just reduce it to technical learning. As one of our students said very uh, wisely yesterday, she said, you know, we need to make a distinction between literacy and real education. And real education is much more than that, which is about learning about yourself. Uh, our organization has been working at this for the last, over the last three decades. We work with a variety of students, and I won't labor that, but from urban uh, environments, rural environments, very remote with special needs children, and they're all represented here in the audience, by the way, they're all here in full force to learn and to share. You know, I we mentioned, if you looked at our vision, and again, I'm going to refer to the conversation I had with our students. When we started to speak about Ukraine and global wars, and we asked the question, is that the only kind of violence? And I think somebody mentioned, I think it was you, uh, Christy, Simone, about the kinds of invisible violence, which happens every day, and it goes unnoticed. And I think the most important violence that I have experienced personally in my life, and I see every day, is something that India's daughters face all the time. They're unwanted, unsafe, unequal, unfree. I won't read, they don't have the heart to read all the statistics that you see, and I'm sure you have read them. But while we've been talking, while I've been here, imagine at this presentation, while we've been here, I'm here for an hour now, four girls have been raped. So girls and women live under terror all the time, and it's an important kind of violence. And while that happens, what piece do we talk about? So what do we do and how do we address it? We've developed a critical feminist pedagogy and we sit down and we talk, we tell stories, we tell stories about our own lives. And the idea is to understand why this is happening to us, to us, to our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, and to understand that it's like somebody else said earlier, that it's not just me, that it's happening with everyone. So clearly there's some problem with the structure problem with the system. And once you understand that, once you talk about power, you see how it plays it, who has it, who doesn't have it, and why. And you understand that this is human made. This is not God made. This is not natural. And you are helped to envision a world where things can be different. It can be non violent It can be nurturing. It can be caring. It can be a peaceful world. Your gender relationships can be peaceful and loving and caring and nurturing. That is when you begin to find the courage to transform. We use critical dialogues as a regular part of our curriculum every week, every week. And we found them had, had to have a huge impact. But we don't just use, we don't just sit and talk. We use drama, and someone else mentioned the importance of drama. I think, Joe, it was you. We have found it to be a very powerful tool. It is a way for girls and others to rehearse resistance, to rehearse the solutions that they find together, and actually to rehearse life and give them the courage to go and perform this in real life. We use poetry, they write about their lives, they write about their indignation, indignation because we know that people don't have a particular fact of expressing And then while they are doing it, it's not just a process, they read it out to each other. And then you find ways, it's self transformative. And they're able to hold each other in that space and find ways to transform. We don't talk, or we don't work only with girls, we work with boys too. And many of them are here today in the audience because we realize that it's not enough for girls to change, but boys must change. In fact, our campaign this year very large India's Daughters campaign is best to boys and men and saying that, okay, tell us boys and men, how will you change and what will you do to make sure that India's daughters are safe? And our goal with them is for them to understand that, you know, there is another way to be a man. Violence need not define men. But you can be a very nurturing, loving, gentle man and still be a very good man. And they have learned to do that. We tell them that patriarchy is not your fault, but just look at how cruel it is to your sisters, your mothers, 
And there are various ways in which we do this. And I'll give you a very small example. We asked our boys to uh, tell us what they did the whole day. And they did, they told us. And every, almost all of them went out to play in the evening, in the playing field nearby. And I said, what about your sisters? Did they go out to play with an art? They stay at home, they work, they cook, they study, they don't work. I said, then why don't they? They said, oh, because there's household work to do and, you know, it's not safe. I said, hmm, and are they okay with them? Said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you go ask them? So they went and asked and they came back very chastened. They said, no, I don't want to go. They would like to go out and play. I said, so what can we do about that? So one of them said, you know, we should take them with us. And maybe our parents will let them come. I said, yeah, but then who's going to do the household work? He had no answer. And one of them very hesitantly put his hand up and said, you know, well, maybe we can help them and then we can all go together. I said, yeah. So that's how we try and build empathy. Very naturally, very gently, very normally, normalizing equality and trying to deconstruct the normalized inequality and violence inherent in gender relations. And once again, it has had huge impact. And then together, all our girls, all our girls from all our units, they go and they campaign. One year we worked on domestic violence alone. Girls and boys ran signature campaigns, they did street plays. And the whole goal was to get the community to understand and to see how violent life was for women and to pledge that they would not do it. And the sad part is in this case, it is families themselves. There have been cases where girls are burned to death because she got pregnant. We need her out of the way. And that's the other kind of violence that we work on is class violence, class violence, religion. Again, I mentioned that the dialogue that we had, the students came up with religion very quickly. They said there's a lot of communal violence these days and all based on religion. So we talked about that. And we also talked about how religion needs to be questioned too. So we need to understand each other, each other's religion, and we need to have the courage to question our own religions when they are going wrong. And people were using religion for all kinds of purposes. The other thing that people rarely talk about, and which is another huge source of violence, especially in India, and I think peculiar to India, is past violence. A scheduled caste person faces crime every 10 minutes in India in the past year. And these are, these are the National Crime Bureau statistics. So once again, while we've been talking, somebody has been violent because he was from Delhi or from the scheduled tribes. And so over the year, in one year, in 2020, there were 50,291 cases, and out of which only 219 were taken to trial, and even fewer than those were convicted. So we talk about caste. Okay, we're trying to build a curricula for this. When, what we have done is build curricula around all of this. And the way we do that is we first work with the students, and then we look at what emerged from the students' conversations, and then we build a curriculum. Even with caste, it's important. We're trying to work with all of them, not just the Dalits, but even the Brahmins and all the so-called the forward caste, as they like to call them, or the Savarnas, to try and build a sense of empathy, to try and look at your own unconscious bias and see the kinds of violence that we all engage in without even knowing it, because it's part of our culture, our DNA, our history, and we don't even recognize it. And there again, there's a lot of resistance to that. People don't want to talk about caste. And there is enormous caste violence that goes, like somebody said, invisible, not so invisible, but just normalized. The people just accept it because they don't, they're not aware that it, it they just, they, they get numbed by it because it happens so much. And because past is such a strong reality in this country, even so after so many years of independence, when it shouldn't be there because it is antithetical, patriarchy, caste, these are all antithetical to democracy. They should not exist because they violate the principle of equality. They're very violent, but nobody talks about them. So what we do is talk about power, have an open discourse of power in the classroom, make it a safe space to talk about it, to act it, to understand it, and then see how to deconstruct it. This picture, and actually, Reva, you were there for this class that we talked. 
and some of your colleagues, where we talked about terrorism. We got them to act it out. We acted out the scene of terrorists. And the way we did it was one group was sitting at home with their families. These were terrorists. And tomorrow they were going to go on a suicide mission and blow up a train. So we asked them how they felt. They were supposed to sit down. We told them, close your eyes and put your hands on your chest and sleep up on your feet. Many of them said scared, no but determined, strong, courageous. And then how did the mothers feel? How did the sisters feel? What conversation do you think they were having? And the mothers and sisters trying to dissuade them that don't go. It's not okay. It's innocent people. You shouldn't be going. You should know that it's important for our religion. And then we acted out the scene of the After which we got them to talk. And I cannot tell you how stunned I was at the maturity, the empathetic and sympathetic conversation that the students had. It came to the point where they needed to discuss these things. The error was not an answer. One very wise student yes, at our conversation a few days, two or three days ago said, he said it in Urdu, and I'll say it in Urdu and then translate. And he said, you know, that jung, kisi masla, masle ka hal nahi hai, jung kudhi ek masla hai. That war and violence is never a solution to any problem. It's the problem itself. And what our students came down to at the end, and I remember quote from some of the things from our books that we said, because I was just totally inspired by that. As I told you, after we went through Ukraine, then we talked about all the other kinds of violence that came out. Bullying was one of them. And finally, they came out to say that actually the root of all of it is that we are not self-aware. It is the I and the ego. We all want to be on top. And it is so I feel selfishness, satisfaction, and ego play a very vital role in this. And that human beings are influenced by need, desire, and greed, and ambition, and the ego, the I in ourselves. And the last one said that, you know, and peace is not just about peace of mind. It is also about giving hope and opportunity to others. So, you know, after this whole discussion about an hour and a half, and they didn't want to stop, mind you. We had to stop because we were running out of time. But I was so inspired by how maturely and how they were able to be unpackaged the whole thing and not stop just at a global visible wall, but bring it down to the person, to the self, and say that what we need is more self-awareness. And they all agreed that school is a good place for us to be discussing this, stopping this, and if there's any future, then we need to take, talk about violence, talk about power talk about everything that is wrong and find together solutions of solving our conflicts without violence. And of course, they also said, and our boys said it, by the way, that, you know, somehow, if we had more women as leaders, the world might be different. Because boys and men seem to think that violence is the first thing, and also they wear it like an ornament almost, that it's a badge of honor violence. So I'm going to close there, Reva, and uh, just end with what our students said. That, and go back to the question that I had put on our slide earlier, that who am I and how am I related to the universe and others in it? I think that's a really important question that we should be saying, and I can see in all our presentations with Simon, this to yours, that how in various ways, I think that's what we are trying to do get our students to understand who they are, understand what their relationship is between us, with the trees, the stars, the rivers, the mountains, with everybody else. What is that? Is it a competitive one? Is it one of power? Is it a collaborative one? Is it loving? What should it be? What can it be? What's the potential? And I think it's time that our curriculum everywhere changed from of this decontextualized, self-alienating focus on technical education and bring it back to the self and our relationship and our connectedness with everything else in the universe. I think that's the only hope. And that's one way of achieving I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Urvashi. Um, once again, I'm just blown away by all of the work that all of you are doing. 
through the Study Health Education Foundation and the amazing things that you personally continue to do.